This is America Daily, bringing you the best in truthful news updates and in-depth reports happening now. Welcome to America Daily. I'm Jessica Beatty. On today's podcast, what you need to know about the United Nations and its radical ideology. According to its website, the United Nations is an international organization founded in 1945 after World War II by 51 countries. Well, the day the charter was signed, there were 50 countries. Poland was not represented, but signed and joined later. The UN declares that, due to its unique international character and the powers vested in its founding charter, they can take action on a wide range of issues. The UN says it provides a forum for its nearly 200 member states to express their views through the General Assembly, the Security Council, and the Economic and Social Council, among others. The UN declares that although they are known for their peacekeeping, peacebuilding, conflict prevention, and humanitarian assistance, there are many other ways the UN affects our lives and makes the world a better place. But does it really make the world a better place? They claim to have four main purposes to keep peace throughout the world to develop friendly relations among nations, to help nations work together to improve the lives of poor people, and lastly, to be a center for harmonizing the actions of nations to achieve these goals. America Daily reporter Vanessa Rios Gomez goes in-depth to explain what the UN's agenda actually aims to do. Thanks, Jess. After World War II, the expectation was that the United Nations would help countries throughout the world get along better in efforts to create peace where there was none and to help maintain peace where there was. However, when looking at the list of original founders, it's a bit difficult to think they all believed in their own mission. The United Nations officially came into existence on October 24, 1945, and on that day, the Charter had been ratified by key nations, such as the Soviet Union, the United States, and the UK, among others who played less important roles at that time. This was the Soviet Union, headed by Joseph Stalin. According to detailed research by Yale historian Timothy Snyder, Joseph Stalin deliberately killed at least 6 million people. Census reports showed that between 1932 and 1939, the Soviet population decreased by at least 9 million. This was before World War II. And so then, this means Stalin was joining the United Nations allegedly in efforts to create a more harmonious and peaceful world. How could that be? Fool me once, shame on you. And yet, somehow, much of the world has been fooled into thinking the United Nations was formed to bring peace and prosperity to countries. Alex Newman, a reporter for The New American, explains the dynamics of the first convention that created the UN Charter. So on one side of the table, you had Joseph Stalin, a mass murderer who wanted to exterminate millions of people and enslave humanity under a global communist dictatorship. And on the other side of the table, you had our people, right? We sent a guy called Alger Hiss, and boy, did they love Alger Hiss. That should have been our first warning sign. They made him the, the secretary general of the UN. He got to run the conference where they came up with the UN charter. Then a few years later, we ended up throwing him in prison because he was an agent of uh, Stalin. And we proved that in court that he was committing perjury. So that was a you know a big warning sign. Even the people who weren't technically busted working with Stalin uh, and, and betraying the United States, people like John Foster Dulles, one of the founding fathers of the Council on Foreign Relations, he wrote in his book, War or Peace, that the UN was supposed to serve as the embryonic uh, nucleus of the future world government. And he said, actually, there's no proposal for world government with teeth in it that I've seen that we couldn't carry out under the Charter of the United Nations, which purports to obligate the United States to commit troops whenever the UN Security Council demands it, as, as opposed to you know our method where Congress has to declare war. So right from the beginning, it was clear that this was the goal, but it did take them 70 years before they finally came out of the closet and just started admitting that, hey, we wanna be the global government, you're gonna submit to us. Uh, Ban Ki-moon is now calling the UN the Parliament of Humanity. He was the Secretary General until recently. So um, you know now they're out of the closet on this, but uh, we should have known all along, Duke. So over time, the United Nations made it clear their intent was for world domination. Maybe they didn't use those exact words back then. In 1992, Agenda 21, basically their blueprint for world domination, was made public at the Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro. 178 governments voted to adopt the agenda, including our own United States of America. 
President George Herbert Walker Bush signed for the U.S. In signing, those government leaders pledged their country would adopt Agenda 21's goals. The agenda went through a few changes over the years. And in 2012, the U.N. reaffirmed their commitment to Agenda 21 in a document they called The Future We Want. Around that same time, activists such as Tea Party members took a strong oppositional stance against Agenda 21. They spoke out against the agenda's efforts to control where people lived and how they used energy specifically. It was clear to them the UN agenda is to control the masses as they wish, to become the overlords of the entire world. The bigger picture here that I think everybody needs to understand is that as we move toward this model of global governance that the United Nations is pushing, we're moving away from Americanism, which is what our founding fathers established. Uh, and the two are as different as night and day. There are some very superficial similarities, but when you compare the UN's vision of human rights with the founding fathers' vision of inalienable, God-given rights, the two are, are for all intents and purposes, they are opposites. It was there they made public Agenda 2030. They took all the goals set by Agenda 21 and reaffirmed them as the basis for sustainable development in Agenda 2030. The Charter took it upon themselves to create an updated agenda that would be adopted by all member nations. Their main objective, to create a utopia on Earth, resolving that by 2030 they would end all poverty, hunger, combat inequalities in all nations, and build a just and inclusive society, protecting human rights, promoting gender equality, and empowerment of women and girls. Basically, the UN is promising heaven on earth. To some, it might appear that the UN is doing something it cannot possibly create, but will try to use power to control who and what it wishes with a seemingly redux communist manifesto. Whereas rights are given by God, it appears the UN, a godless entity, seeks to govern what those rights are instead. And this is likely where people become divided. Some think those promises are good, that the global agenda is a noble one. And others don't. Alex Newman makes it clear he thinks UN directives are satanic because they go against Judeo-Christian values. It becomes an up or down, good or bad, black or white, dark or light issue because there's no point where neutrality is an option. True neutrality means no action in either direction, having no directive, thus no UN. Cause for alarm. The Roman Catholic hierarchy are in line with the UN and are calling for a global education system. And you might wonder, what's wrong with that? Well, the irony is how a global education system would remove and replace Catholic and Christian education systems themselves. An education system that fulfills its duty globally would have to remove anything religious from its curriculum to adapt to all faiths, or none. Or it would have to adopt all religions and its teachings. Either way, those actions go against orthodox teachings of any faith. Essentially, the UN's directives and goals would replace faith-based moral teachings and principles in any faith-based schools. And if you're wondering, why not public schools? Well, that's because they've mostly succeeded in taking that out of public schools by now. Uh, you know, I've seen uh, very prominent Catholics talk about this stuff as heresy, a as actually satanic doctrines. Uh, there's uh, Mother Miriam who read it uh, on her program, a wonderful Catholic nun who has a, a radio show and a, and a talk show. Some of the episodes are, are seen just on YouTube by hundreds of thousands of people. And she was reading our special report that you and I did uh, in Rescuing Our Children in the New American. And uh, in that episode, she talks about some of the stuff that the Pope is saying, like that we have to obey the United Nations and that we need a global village to educate the children for a new humanism. She says, you know, not only are we not required to obey this stuff that the Pope is saying as Catholics, right, these contradict Catholic teaching. She said, these are heresies. These are satanic ideas that the Pope is spreading, and we are not obligated to obey them. Yes, we need to be respectful of the Pope's office and, and the Pope himself, but we do not need to obey these things. And uh, you know, it, it's all converging 
in this globalist nightmare that is coming into view now. And, you know, this whole issue of the difference between God-given rights and human rights is, I think, going to become more and more fundamental. So what we went through in our article, we talk about how, um, you know, the U.N. is actually claiming that our God-given rights are violations of human rights. Newman believes Agenda 21, now officially known as Agenda 2030, infringes on Americans' God-given rights on several levels. So they say that, uh, you know, spanking your children as a disciplinary tool is a violation of human rights and that the U.S. government needs to throw parents in jail who discipline their children that way. They say that gun rights are a violation of international human rights law because, uh, you know, racism and, and, you know, other things that have absolutely nothing to do with gun rights. They say that uh, self-defense laws, violation of U.N. human rights. They say free speech, violation of human rights. So you have a, a dictator's club that is completely out of control. And unless we take urgent steps to put a stop to this, uh, it's going to swallow our freedom and it's going to swallow our country. Over the last few years, the UN's hidden agenda has been coming to light. More and more Americans are becoming aware of the potentially disastrous effects the agenda's implementation would have on our country and the world. It's not just Americans who are waking up to the Marxist nature of the United Nations either. There is an interesting resistance movement developing. You know, I think uh, Trump has really emboldened a lot of people around the world to take action here. So you have Jair Bolsonaro in uh, in Brazil who talks about the UN's uh, global warming scam as a Marxist ruse to destroy Western civilization. Uh, you know, they, they told the UN you can take your climate circus elsewhere because they were they were originally scheduled to be in Brazil. This was scheduled back when the Brazil had a communist government. Uh, they said, no, you can take your, your clown show somewhere else. Thank you very much. It's not coming to Brazil. Uh, you have, as you mentioned, uh, Victor Orban in Hungary. You have the Poles. You have uh, a, a really interesting example came up with this mass migration pact. In December, the UN was trying to shove through this international kind of pseudo treaty. They didn't want to call it a treaty because they knew the U.S. Senate would never ratify it, but they called it a, an agreement on mass migration, trying to make uh, international migration a human right. Well, Trump was the first one to stand up and say, no, we're not going to do that. And then after that, it was just like dominoes. Then it was Viktor Orban said, we're not going to sign on either. Then you had Austria, you had Croatia, you had Chile, you had Brazil, you had Israel, you had all the countries that the migrants want to go to saying, we're not going to participate in this fraud. So it was uh, an early sign of resistance. You know, we've been talking about education. Now Trump withdrew us from UNESCO, uh, a major, if only temporary victory in this struggle. Uh, Trump has has gotten us out of multiple U.N. agreements. He's now in the process of getting us out of the Paris Agreement. We've got to hope that that goes through. So a lot of progress on this front. You won't hear about it from the fake media unless it's to demonize Trump. But uh, there is a, a powerful resistance movement building against this globalism. Uh, Trump's speech at the U.N. General Assembly gave some very uh, interesting comments on all this. So it's a, it's a fascinating time to be alive. United States Congress members are speaking out saying the United States should get out of the United Nations and fast. Washington State Representative Matt Shea recently spoke with The New American, giving his reasons for why the U.S. should withdraw from the U.N. First, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, which is tied in with the Muslim Brotherhood, works very, very closely with Recep Erdogan of Turkey, uh, who really is recognized by the Muslim Brotherhood as a leader in the world, uh, they represent a vast majority of countries in the United Nations. The rest of the countries generally, or by and large, are represented by the Socialist International. In fact, the current head of the United Nations, Antonio Gutierrez, was a former president of the Socialist International. So you have just two reasons right there not to have anything to do with the United Nations. It's run by socialists and Islamists, and we really shouldn't have anything to do with that. One of the other things that I, I think is, is clear for a lot of people, we all agree there should be diplomacy, there should be discussions, there should be conversations between uh, countries. In fact, that was what kind of originally the United Nations was built at, a place for people to come together to prevent, you know, large wars again. The problem is what it, what it really was and intentionally was created to be was a supranational structure to control the world and control countries in the world. And they're very open about this. They're very open about their plans. Uh, the United Nations ad uh, agenda for the 21st century, a 300-page, 30-chapter document, lays out in detail, even down to the local level, what that, that bureaucracy should look like. And, oh, of course, it should be paid for 
uh, by countries that don't necessarily agree with some of the values that are espoused by Islamists and socialists. So just just a couple of reasons right there that I really kind of take a look at at the first, because a lot of people don't know that that's the case. They know something is really dysfunctional with the United Nations, but they can't really put their finger on it, and that really puts the finger on it. Where the UN was thought to have been created to decrease conflict among nations, critics have pointed out how more often it has been guilty of fomenting conflict. Uh, think about just the uh, human, the so-called human rights committees at the UN and some of the ridiculous countries. I mean, you've got China, you've got Turkey, you've got Saudi Arabia. You've got some of the worst human rights offenders in the world who have chaired and have majorities. Countries like this have had majorities on the commissions dealing with human rights or women's rights or all of these issues that the United Nations uh, pays lip service to. How in the world can even the United Nations justify putting countries like Cuba or Iran or uh, China on these kind of committees. Right, North Korea. And, and then you dig a little deeper even than that, and you, you figure out that there are certain elements linked to Chinese intelligence organizations that are trying to head entire UN agencies. And that doesn't make any sense at all. And then they would try to have you believe that, oh, this is just, again, to you know, create dialogue and yet there is still this push to create some sort of a, a U.N. army uh, that would go in, of course, with the most benevolent reasons into parts of the world uh, to help out. And they're saying that we should trust the fact that Islamist folks linked to the Muslim Brotherhood, socialists, uh, which uh, that entire belief system of socialism and communism resulted in more deaths than other, any other belief system in the history of the world, that the folks that are those countries should be part of a peacekeeping force that we should, uh, we should put our hard-earned money and our treasure and our, our lives into. It's just ridiculous. We as countries, uh, individually and as nation states, nation states were, it was ordained in the Bible. The Bible talks about nation states. The fact is that it represents a particular culture, tradition, heritage, and belief. And all those diversities of belief are great, and we can continue that dialogue. We don't need some superstructure to do it because really what this is about is not dialogue. It's about control. These are the same benevolent blue helmeted armies of the UN that raped its way across Africa when they were sent in exactly. as peacekeepers, right? And, and the thing that's so dangerous if you're not paying attention, uh, Americans aren't paying attention to these blue helmeted armies, is they're exempt. Uh, in the same way that these bureaucrats at the UN in New York can get parking tickets and engage in wife spousal abuse, but we can't do anything to them because they have diplomatic immunity. W think about a global army, a global police force army that is utterly indemnified from any accountability to state or national laws. That's ultimately what they'd like to see happen. Well, yeah, no accountability. And yet we hear from folks who call themselves socialists, there needs to be strong accountability in law enforcement, et cetera, et cetera, and yet they turn a blind eye to what the United Nations is doing in their so-called peacekeeping forces. And this is well documented. This is not speculation or hyperbole or, or any sort of exaggeration. It's very, very well documented. Their plans are very well documented. And the fact of the matter is that as the United States, we have become more prosperous not because of the United Nations, but probably in spite of the United Nations. And these diplomatic immunities for a lot of these folks really have been abused, especially inside the United States. Give us a, a final word on the UN in your opinion today. Look, the, we as the United States need to get out of the United Nations. Other countries will follow our lead if we do so. And I think that countries like Poland and Hungary and other uh, countries in Eastern Europe are looking at this uh, as an option. And I think that we need to take the lead in it. Coming up next, a special from our friends at the BL on how communism destroyed China's traditional culture. The communists were among the most anti-traditional and iconoclastic of all of the political parties in China. They wanted to destroy the past. It was Karl Marx who taught that the proletariat cannot simply conquer state power in the sense that the old state apparatus passes into new hands. 
Marx meant that the working class must smash, break, and shatter the whole state machine, destroying the old to bring in the new. Karl Marx also taught that it was necessary to kill a large segment of the population in order to attain the basic objective of communism. In America today, we're seeing the push to destroy the past. We're seeing the normalization of atheist ideas in our culture, while more and more traditional beliefs and practices are prohibited. It was Lenin that said, the goal of socialism is communism. Liberal politicians in the United States are normalizing and glorifying socialism and spending millions telling us all what that would look like here in America. Dr. Arthur Waldron explains how the Chinese communists have been trying to substitute Soviet-style Marxism for traditional Chinese culture, resulting in a values vacuum. Part two of the BL's In Great Minds series, Understanding Communism. To bring on the new, you must destroy the old. I would say that traditional culture still dominates and the party is still constantly struggling against it. This actually started um, in 1919 or 1920. There was an attack on culture and there's something called the new culture movement. Under the communists, uh, this has taken the form of murdering lots of people who believed in, uh, who, who were followers of traditional Chinese culture, forbidding the publication of uh, books, really modern books that, that explain Chinese culture. After 1950, the great Chinese authors, they all stopped writing, essentially. The communists were among the most anti-traditional and iconoclastic of all of the political parties in China. They wanted to destroy the past. The number of Chinese monuments of uh, antiquity that they have destroyed is, is huge. Perhaps the most extraordinary of these is that um, Peking used to be surrounded by extraordinary walls, They're wide enough for a horse to, horses to ride on top with all kinds of towers and whatnot. And Bertrand Russell said that there are two most impressive cities in the world. One is the walled city of Peking and the other is um, Florence in Italy. The issue arose of what the communists were going to do with the walls and everybody, including the famous architects who had supported Mao, said, look, what we should do is we should build a satellite city and uh, have modern Peking be in the, mo in the satellite city, but we must not destroy these walls. And Mao was angry and he said, we have to tear down these walls. So they tore down the walls. This is perhaps the greatest act, of, one of the greatest acts of cultural vandalism uh, of our time. I mean, it's just unbelievable. Now, of course, killing people is worse, and they've, they, they have killed uh, lots of people. Furthermore, they took over the educational system, and they simply took out um, classical Chinese. They changed the form of written Chinese so that if you're educated in China today, you can't read anything except stuff that the communists publish. And then they tried to substitute um, Marxism, which they borrowed from the Soviet Union, uh, tried to substitute Marxism for Chinese tradition. And this has not worked. Uh, it simply hasn't worked. What it's left is a, a sort of a values vacuum. And uh, it's really a tremendous loss. They couch so much of their appeal to the rest of the world in the idea that they have an ancient civilization. But what they have there basically is a kind of omelet of, uh, based on Stalinism with various Chinese things added to it, but it's got nothing to do. It has no continuity with uh, the real Chinese philosophical traditions. I've been having graduate students for, from China for two decades. So three Chinese students suddenly stood up and they started attacking me. And they said, you are insulting Chinese civilization and Chinese culture, you don't know anything. So I just shouted back at them, adopting cultural revolution style Chinese. I said, how many of you have read the four books of the Confucian classics in the original classical Chinese as I have? And I'm just a white boy from a suburb of Boston 
who for some reason as he was graduating from college decided to study Chinese. The Chinese are, have deep, deep status anxiety. They're afraid that someone's gonna be better than they are. They began to sort of back down because I, I really started abusing them. I said, look, you're telling about great Chinese culture is in you, yet you have not read any of the things that are components of it. So they're in a position where their leaders invoke Chinese culture constantly. And they get mad at any Westerner who has anything to say about Chinese culture. But on the other hand, they themselves do not know this culture of theirs. Chinese um, are currently promoting as Chinese culture, a kind of amalgam of uh, Stalinism, um, Chinese sort of fascistic nationalism, cult of the leader, all this sort of stuff. But they're now caught in a sort of trap. They're trying to promote Chinese culture overseas. So one of the things they have is something called the Confucius Institutes. Now, when you consider that Confucius was on the receiving end of attack after attack after attack, from the communists and also from sort of progressively minded Chinese and people who thought there was anything good to be said for Confucius were considered to be sort of fossils. It's interesting to me that the Confucius, that these institutes to which China pays and which are used as um, centers, not just for teaching, attempting to teach Chinese, but they're also used as centers for surveillance over Chinese students and for espionage purposes. It's interesting that they call them Confucius Institutes. Uh, they really should be called Mao Institutes or Chinese Communist Institutes, but they were called that. Westerners would not be so happy. It shows that Confucius still has a kind of prestige uh, that's more than the Communist Party has been able to gather to itself in 70 years um, of rule. The great tradition of Chinese civilization is, for the moment, uh, been cut off in China itself. What we're seeing in China now is a tremendous sense of regret over the destruction that was carried out by the Communist Party and an attempt to restore. Now, if something is unsustainable indefinitely, it will stop supplies the People's Republic of China. It simply suffers from design flaws and therefore at some point it's going to stop. Lessons in history will remind us that when traditional values are eliminated, all that is left is regret. Don't miss part three of the BL's In Great Minds series, Understanding Communism. Dr. Arthur Waldron discusses how the power of the crowd is a threat to government power. For the BL, I'm Rich Crankshaw with In Great Minds. Join us in the next few shows as we delve deeper into what the UN's agenda is, how it shelters authoritarian criminals, and uses cries of climate change to justify its end goal of a one world government. If you're listening on the radio and missed some of this episode, you can visit americadaily.com to hear it in full. Or subscribe to our podcast by searching for America Daily Top Stories. Once again, I'm Jessica Beatty. Thanks for listening. This is America Daily. Bringing you the best in truthful news updates and in-depth reports happening now. 